What's going on, everybody? Thanks for tuning back to the Alma Mac here on 93.3 CFMU, where we interview McMaster graduate students about what they enjoy doing inside and outside of the lab. I would like to acknowledge that CFMU is situated upon the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Mississaugas of the New Credit and protected within the lands of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Thank you, as always, for tuning back uh, Thursdays, 12 to 1230 here on the Alma Mac. We, for today's episode, we have another wonderful McMaster graduate student that is joining us, first year master's student, Josh Cherubini from the Faculty of Science in the Department of Kinesiology. How are things hanging today, Josh? Things are great, Severa. How are you? I'm doing okay. Also hanging in there. Also hanging in there. Awesome. So Josh, before we dig into your research, I would actually kind of like to know a little bit about your graduate experience, because as I mentioned, you're a first year master's student. So um, newly starting graduate school, perhaps new at McMaster, but you also started this new chapter in your life during the height of the pandemic. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that and that experience? So exactly, as you said, I did begin graduate school right as I guess the pandemic was peaking in September, 2020. I was fortunate though, that I was able to do, so I did my undergraduate in kinesiology at McMaster. And as part of the undergraduate experience, students are offered uh, potential placements in the program in third year and fourth year. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to do my third year placement in the lab in which I'm currently involved in the vascular dynamics lab. The course code is 3RP3. So I did my 3RP3 in the vascular dynamics lab and again, was fortunate enough to stay on for a fourth year thesis as well. Um, so during my fourth year thesis, we kind of made the transition from in-person school activities, tests, and, and in-person participant recruitment to an online environment. And so that kind of marked the transition between pre-COVID and post-COVID. Um, but certainly the in-person experience, both in the lab and at McMaster, kind of facilitated a smoother transition into graduate school. Um, but certainly I can imagine it, it'd certainly be a difficult experience for those who are not native to Hamilton um, or haven't experienced the city before and starting a new school in COVID. I, it would be a, certainly unique challenges um, with that endeavor as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, only experiencing Hamilton in a, in a pandemic world must be a really different. I can't imagine what that's like. And I know you and I were talking about this earlier, but I'm, I'm really feeling for students, especially who haven't even set foot on campus because they started during the pandemic. Uh, so hopefully they're able to see the campus soon. Hopefully soon. Yeah, there's so many nice things about campus. Even just studying with other people in a library is something that I miss so much. And yeah. hopefully yeah, just- soon. Exactly. Just walking around, uh, running into familiar faces. It was uh, so nice to do in the pre-COVID times. The small things that we took for granted. Exactly. But we're coming back. Thank you to vaccines. Thank you to science. We're coming back. Exactly. Exactly. So Yeah, go on. Sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. You can finish. No, I was just gonna say I've got both my vaccines, which is which is, of course, a step in the right direction. Oh, yeah, great. I'm fully vaccinated as well. But let me t- I don't know how it was for you, Josh, but it was hard to find those appointments. I don't know how people found vaccine appointments without Twitter or obviously <laughs> Vaccine Hunters Canada. I'm not sure what you used. Vaccine Hunters must be the MVP of, of, of Canada right now, for sure. They're wonderful. Completely agree. Great group of volunteers. Exactly. Uh, so speaking of science, Josh, if you can actually tell us a little bit about your graduate research. And I'm also curious to know if you, the current research you're doing now is an extension of what you started during your undergrad or if you pivoted since then? Yeah, for sure. So in, our under, in my undergrad, we looked at the effects. Of, one of the projects that we looked on was the effects of partial sleep deprivation on arterial function. And so one, certainly being an undergrad, it's, 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 the experience of sleep deprivation is pretty common. And I, I, that carried through grad school too as well. And I'm sure Severi, you can relate to that experience. And so it was definitely interesting to look at the effects of such a common experience on uh, cardiovascular function. And so carried into graduate school now, we are continuing to pursue the, my, my, the undergraduate thesis uh, project that, that I was involved in on sleep deprivation and arterial function. About my interest more broadly, I guess, is sleep deprivation not only for undergraduate students, but for a lot of Western society is an increasing problem. 
I say that uh, and it's, it's certainly a health concern. And again, it's kind of funny to say that in, 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 as we're hunkered down in a stay at home order during COVID, but nonetheless, it certainly is a, is a health concern and um, affects many different areas of physiology from cardiovascular health to metabolic health, to mental health, and even mm-hmm. physical performance as well. And so given uh, the broad ramifications of insufficient sleep, we find it interesting to focus on the effects of insufficient sleep on cardiovascular function. We're also an exercise physiology lab, the vascular dynamics lab, and a related research question is the extent to which fitness levels or physical activity can mitigate detriments in cardiovascular health that may arise as a consequence of short sleep durations. Fascinating. So you're first interested in looking at this association of sleep deprivation and cardiovascular health and risk profile, and then perhaps seeing if exercise, exercise intensity can somehow intervene and break that potential link. That's exactly it. Fascinating. And Josh, can you, so to take a step back, what would be, what is the definition of sleep deprivation? Because like you mentioned, a lot of students like, uh, um, you or I, you know, we might say, oh, we're totally sleep de- deprived, but I can say that without actually knowing the definition of, so if you can speak to that a little bit. That's a great question. There are a couple of definitions of sleep deprivation and they depend on the, both the type of sleep deprivation and the duration of sleep deprivation. So just with regards to the types of sleep deprivation, there's total sleep deprivation, which uh, is similar to your all nighter experience. So if you pull mm-hmm. an all nighter, you go the whole night without any sleep you'd be totally sleep deprived the subsequent day. And then there's also partial sleep deprivation, which refers to getting a amount of sleep that would be less than that which you usually get. So typically around five hours, if you usually get around seven hours of sleep and then one night you get five, four hours of sleep, you would be partially sleep deprived. And then you can separate sleep deprivation according to the duration of sleep deprivation So we have acute instances of sleep deprivation. Again, I'll refer to the all-nighter of one night of total sleep deprivation being an acute instance of total sleep deprivation. Or you can have chronic um, iterations of sleep deprivation where you're chronically deprived of sleep uh, for, again, either total durations, if maybe you have to pull several nights consecutive of no sleep, which is, I would guess, pretty rare, or uh, partial sleep deprivation where you maybe have a stressful week Um, or a sleep disorder of some sort where you can't get uh, the amount of sleep that you need and you would be chronically partially sleep deprived. Oh, that's so interesting. I I hadn't considered that there would be so many different types of sleep profiles and then maybe how those might later influence cardiovascular risk and if there's differences between those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a a really interesting question. There are so so many different sleeping profiles and sleeping behaviors that have different implications for cardiovascular health. And it it certainly is interesting to consider the the differential impacts of of different sleeping profiles and behaviors. Okay, so Josh, so it seems like research has shown that there is a link between sleep deprivation, whatever those sleeping behaviors or types um, may be, and with cardiovascular risk. Do we know the mechanisms that may underlie this relationship? How is it that lack of sleep, sleep deprivation increases your risk for certain cardiovascular problems? So I can speak to certainly to cardiovascular functioning, probably more so than other pathologies. As you mentioned, Zavera, there are certainly associations between insufficient sleep durations and cardiovascular risk. Um, And so some of the mechanisms that underlie these associations involve things like inflammation, um, perhaps some metabolic or genetic elements, and also nervous system dysregulation. So I guess we can start with nervous system dysregulation. You have your nervous system, which fundamentally can be divided into two different branches, a fight or flight branch, noted by the parasympathetic or excuse me, the sympathetic nervous system. And then you can have your rest and digest branch noted by the parasympathetic nervous system. And so when you go to sleep, the parasympathetic nervous system fundamentally dominates during that period of sleep. And when you're awake and aroused and stimulated, your fight or flight or sympathetic nervous system dominates relative to the parasympathetic nervous system. 
And so when you deprive your body of the opportunity for parasympathetic or, or rest and digest dominance uh, during the night, you increase the relative outflow of sympathetic stimulation. And so this autonomic dysregulation, I suppose it's referred to in the literature, can result in increases in cardiovascular risk. One of, I guess, the mechanisms um, behind that even is the associations between increases in sympathetic activity and inflammation. And so when you have heightened states of inflammation, uh, certain cellular processes can be upregulated that result in less than favorable adaptations, uh, both in your arteries and, and even heart rate uh, and, and several other cardiovascular parameters. Um, I suppose one of the things that our lab is also interested in looking at are metabolic and genetic determinants of cardiovascular function that may be altered during sleep deprivation compared to normal sleep. So we have these circadian genes, let's call them in our brain, certainly, which regulates sleep and wake, but also in almost every cell in our body. And so these circadian genes fluctuate in their activity on a 24-hour basis. So in some periods of the night, they might be uh, maybe dormant or maybe active. And in other periods of the day, they might be, again, comparatively less active or more active compared to their state. I think, you're, are you referring to like the suprachiasmatic nucleus and then um, how like, like, I didn't know this before, like doing more research onto it, but then you have, like, I knew about that, but then there's also like these peripheral clocks in your cells that are like, yes. these, yeah, I don't know about that. So um, exactly, no. fascinating. It's made up of the same genetic components that are in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So you have the suprachiasmatic nucleus as the central pacemaker, or at least, uh, the, yeah, the central clock that coordinates your behavioral activities, um, as well as like your sleeping activities. And then you have these peripheral clocks in all the different cells and tissues of your body that regulate circadian behaviors and circadian function of those specific tissues. Mm -hmm. So you also have circadian rhythms in your arteries. Um, fundamentally speaking, and, and, and some of these circadian rhythms in your arteries fluctuate on a, on a day night basis, a diurnal basis, and perhaps may respond to sleep deprivation or insufficient sleep. Fascinating. Um, Josh, I'm also curious to know what kind of techniques or methods might you use in the lab to look at the um, impact of sleep deprivation on arterial function? So right now, Due to the COVID pandemic, of course, I haven't really um, had much opportunity to look at circadian genes or metabolic uh, instances or metabolic um, parameters. Right now, we're mostly focused on uh, more quote unquote dry lab techniques, such as ultrasonography, which is super interesting. One of the tests that we use is called the flow mediated dilation test. And so the premise of this test uh, is that essentially a healthy artery would be able to accommodate an increase in blood flow by distending. Okay. So its diameter would increase in response to a larger bolus of blood flowing through it. And we can artificially modulate the amount of blood that flows through an artery using a blood pressure cuff. Oh. So one of the things that we do in our lab is use a blood pressure cuff um, and inflate the blood pressure cuff to a really high pressure that occludes a lot of blood flow throughout, for instance, the arm. And we can measure how the, one of, how the artery behaves uh, in response to when we deflate the cuff and the bolus of blood rushes through the artery. We can measure how the artery di dilates in response to the increase in arterial flow, hence the term flow mediated dilation. And for, um, every percent that the artery dilates is associated with like better arterial health and a lower cardiovascular disease risk profile. And conversely, when the artery doesn't dilate as much as you would want it to, it's indicative of a stiffer artery and a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Okay, that's really interesting. So is the idea potentially to get individuals with different sleeping behaviors, perhaps experiencing sleep deprivation, and then make this make them undergo this flow mediated dilation technique and see how much or 
little dilation there is, and then perhaps relate that to their cardiovascular profile. That's exactly what it is. And actually what we're doing right now is an interventional study. We're in the process of, of uh, recruiting participants for an interventional study where we're going to hope to look at the effects of acute partial sleep deprivation on flow mediated dilation. So how much the artery dilates in response to increases in blood flow, both after several nights of normal sleep and then after one night of acute partial sleep deprivation, which we define as one night of a three hour sleep opportunity. Oh, Fascinating. Interesting. It is pretty interesting. Yeah. And Josh, I know earlier you talked about um, how exercise might kind of break this link between sleep deprivation and increased risk for cardiovascular disease. So I'm curious if you have any potential um, projects that might be in the works for that using exercise as an intervention. Yeah. So certainly exercise is involved with cardiovascular disease risk and sleep durations. A study was recently published, actually, that concluded cardiovascular disease risk was lowest, or at least relative risk, was lowest amongst those who had healthy sleeping habits and were moderately to vigorously physically active. So physically active enough to get a a good sweat on and maybe your heart rate up, get out of breath a little bit. Those individuals combined with the healthy sleeping patterns had the lowest cardiovascular disease risk profile relative to those who didn't have as much physical activity experience and uh, also had poor sleeping habits. So that just goes to show that physical activity and, and fitness is involved with the relationship between sleep deprivation and arterial function or cardiovascular health. And so related to our study, we are actually looking at a measure of fitness called a VO2 max test. And so essentially it's a, it's a measure of fitness that's determined by how long or how hard you can cycle on a bicycle. And from that, we can get what's called your VO2 max or VO2 peak in our case, which is essentially how much um, oxygen that your body can use. And we can uh, use that to see if those with a higher fitness levels predicted by their VO2 max or VO2 peak, um, We can use that to see if those with higher fitness levels maybe have a different response to sleep deprivation at the level of their Mm. arterial function. That's fascinating that you're talking about these interactions. I I hadn't considered, I guess, the uh, influence that exercise can have. Certainly, yeah. Exercise is such a powerful stimulus. It can influence your body in all sorts of ways. And, and, And it's really interesting. I completely agree with you in the ways that exercise can influence your cardiovascular responses. To, uh, to sleep deprivation. Josh, I'm also curious, I guess, about the short-term versus long-term impacts and consequences of sleep deprivation. So for instance, you know, earlier you defined um, total versus partial sleep deprivation. I'm also curious, for instance, about shift workers who might, um, mm. you know, constantly have been doing this for a long time, or you're talking about the chronicity of things. And then now we're talking about exercise. So I guess my question here is, like, to what extent would one have to exercise to really see the long-term benefits? Because I, I imagine that for um, cardiovascular risk, you know, the development of plaque buildup, that takes a while. That's over time. So I'm, if you can just kind of speak to the, I guess, timeline of things. For sure. So acute instances of sleep deprivation specifically total sleep deprivation has been studied with regards to cardiovascular function and acute total sleep deprivation certainly results in transient decreases in cardiovascular function. And these decreases are understood to not persist. Of course, one night of sleep deprivation probably won't have effects that last for quite a long time compared to several nights of sleep deprivation or several weeks of sleep deprivation, or as you said, Uh, chronic shift work where you're working in the night and sleeping during the day or, or, or even like months and years of of sleep deprivation or insufficient sleep. Mm -hmm. I would certainly say that time course studies are needed to delineate the differential effects of, of, of chronic sleep deprivation versus acute sleep deprivation. And even to see how long it takes your body to rebound after an acute night of partial sleep deprivation. These are really be interesting questions that I personally am not familiar with any studies that look at um, such time courses, but would definitely be interested to see. Um, With respect to the 
amount of exercise that's needed or even the type or intensity of exercise that's needed to surmount the negative influence of sleep deprivation on cardiovascular function. Again, I, I think that it's such a burgeoning area of study or such a, a newer area of study, specifically with regards to the interaction of, of exercise and sleep and cardiovascular function, that studies are needed to identify exactly what the right prescription of exercise mm. would be in order to mitigate the influence of sleep induced changes to arterial function. For now though, I would probably venture to say that the best exercise is the one that you're going to do the most often and the one that you enjoy the most, um, being whatever sport you'd like to play, or whether it's maybe you like to lift weights or go for a run, um, or even maybe a leisurely walk with, with your family or friends. I would say that the best exercise to do is the one that you're going to be able to sustain day in, day out, of course, weeks, months, um, and, and, and hopefully years. Thanks for that clarification, Josh. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, Josh, so can you tell us a little bit about what you hope are some potential implications of your research and how they may impact the broader field? For sure. So I think certainly it's understood that exercise is associated with a whole host of positive impacts on the body. And so one of the goals of our research would certainly be to highlight the role of exercise in yet another potential positive um, implication on, on the human body being during sleep deprivation or instances of insufficient sleep. So certainly to highlight exercise as an important stimulus for health and the maintenance of health, but also to highlight healthy sleeping habits where possible, of course, um, in the importance of maintaining cardiovascular and physical health as well. I think that sleep perhaps isn't as considered or as widely emphasized as exercise but does take up about seven, eight, nine hours of our day. And so it should be emphasized, I think, that the importance of, of a healthy sleeping behavior and a healthy sleeping schedule and hopefully encourage individuals to prioritize sleep. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you mentioned that, Josh, because I think maybe now there might be an increasing appre appreciation of the importance of exercise and even you know the advent of exercise prescriptions where you're um, family doctor, for instance, may tell you, hey, uh, try exercising twice a week for this many minutes, however that might be. But I, I appreciate how you're highlighting the importance of healthy sleeping behaviors, because perhaps not um, everybody appreciates the uh, impact that can have on your health. I, I do wonder, um, and you touched about this, touched on this a little bit too, because you said we should promote healthy sleeping behaviors where possible. Um, for instance, some individuals' jobs or lifestyles may not be conducive to healthy sleeping behaviors. Um, so I'm curious, I guess, what kind of uh, future studies, what kind of recommendations or guidelines they would have for those people trying to increase accessibility as much as possible? Yeah, I think that, in, as you said, in the future, finding ways to preserve health in those who for whatever reason, aren't able to attain the recommended sleeping you know, behaviors or durations would be a, a, a very valuable area of study. Perhaps certain lighting in the workplaces might serve to benefit um, those who are, sh are, are shift workers and, and preserve some aspects of physical health. But um, one of the goals of our research, of course, is, is to emphasize exercise as a potential um, alternative or a potential way to supplement your, your daily life with a stimulus that might mitigate some of the effects of, of shift work on, um, on cardiovascular health. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned this earlier too, that more studies are needed to kind of um, get the exact recommendations or guidelines for the intensity, the type of exercise, the length of exercise. Um, but hopefully once that research comes out, uh, I, I wonder if an individual were to receive you know, an actual prescription, an exercise prescription from their family doctor. Um, I feel, you know, just being handed that piece of paper rather than just being told, oh, you need to exercise more. You know, there's, there's difference in that. And hopefully there would be greater uptake. Oh, I completely agree. I think being able to be handed an exercise prescription from your doctor might even just add structure to your mm. exercise regime. And for someone who's not familiar with exercise or exercise physiology might just make it that much more uh, easier or accessible for them to implement their exercise prescription into their daily life. So yeah, certainly exercise prescription would be a really big key in order to facilitate the uptake of exercise for those who, um, in, in, in daily life, especially in, in short sleep durations. Yeah. 
So Josh, you, um, uh, you know, you're in the Department of Kinesiology, you did your bachelor's in that, you also study exercise, but it's a big part of your non-academic life as well. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? <laughs> yes. So Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it's a martial art. It's kind of like wrestling, like you'd see in the Olympics, except there are certainly some pretty large differences, mainly in that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu doesn't involve any like pins or anything like that. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is focused on um, a lot of grappling and groundwork and uh, some submissions and fancy things like that. And it really is a great workout and a great way to stay fit and my way to stay fit of choice. I recently took it up before the COVID pandemic happened. And of course, COVID has put a stall to that, but I certainly look forward to getting back uh, to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and, uh, and physical activity in general in that regard. Yeah, I was going to ask how long you've been um, pursuing it, but it seems like about a year and a half now. Is that correct? Yes, about a year, about a year and a half. I, yeah, I, re- I took it out before COVID. And unfortunately, yeah, it, uh, it kind of got pushed by the wayside. But definitely looking forward to getting back to it. It's, it's such a great way to stay fit and, and, and just a great way to stay, ex- stay uh, exercising. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I always find that, well, for me at least, um, doing a sport rather than um, like running or any sort of other exercise is much easier for me because uh, I guess I just don't have the patience of just running on a treadmill. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, I don't have the patience for that either, or just lifting weights. I definitely enjoy having uh, like a sport or, or, or something with, with uh, a more tangible objective, I guess, at least in my opinion, in my perspective. That's how, that's how I like to exercise. So um, since I guess the pandemic has put the jiu-jitsu on a halt for now, but hopefully that'll uh, get back up and running soon. Are there any other pandemic hobbies that you've filled or um, how you've been spending your time? I've been going for a lot of hikes. And I uh, have also been biking. I live about a 15, 20 minute bike ride away from the Hamilton uh, Lake area. And so I go for bikes along the beach path whenever possible, which has been a great way, especially during summer, to, to get out of the house a little bit and, 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 and be active. Oh, that's wonderful to hear, Josh. And, you know, we're lucky to have, um, you know, such beautiful areas uh, right in our own city. Oh, we are. Yeah. From, from beach, beach paths to, to even trails. Yeah, There's so the many different trails. ways to, to, to get out and, and explore for sure. Yeah. Very fortunate. Well, thank you, Josh, for coming on the show today and talking about your really important and exciting research. I learned a lot and I'm certain our listeners did as well. Thanks so much for the invitation. And thank you to all of you who are listening every Thursday, 12 to 1230. Stay tuned next week where we will have another McMaster graduate student. But for now, take care. Get Lit is coming up next. Hey everyone, Adam here. Thanks so much for listening. I really hope you uh, enjoyed the episode. If you liked it and you want to hear more, you can head to scientificcanada.ca. We have uh, the audio, we have the video, uh, and we have a whole bunch of other interviews just like this one. If you're a grad student and you're interested in being on the show, get in touch. You can find me on Twitter at Adam Fortis. That's F-O-R-T-A-I-S. Yeah, just drop me a line and let me know. We would love to have you. Anyway, thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.